Welcome to this preview of 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, reading from the New Revised Standard Version Bible of 2022, with ancient Greek manuscript variants in green type. This lesson is intended for those who lead highly interactive men's Bible discussion groups. Introduce the lesson by reminding everyone that this book was produced during Paul's second missionary journey after he had spent three weeks in Thessalonica before fleeing to Athens and then on to Corinth from whence he wrote First and Second Thessalonians to the new believers whom he had left in Thessalonica. In this lesson, we shall seek to find out how we should pray whilst waiting for the Lord and how we should live whilst waiting for the Lord. Provide some background comments. For example, how the Thessalonian believers were suffering religious persecution and civil prosecution. How some feared that they could not survive under the man of sin in the coming day of the Lord. For some had stopped working expecting the Lord soon to return, bringing in the kingdom of God. You might start with a brief discussion of whether the participants ever feel despised or persecuted because of their Christian faith or identity. For North Americans, this might include being Anglo or English-speaking, taking an anti-war stance, simply being a Bible believer or a social Christian, perhaps even a church member. Some identify as capitalists, though not all. Are they conservative in their political views or constitutionalists regarding law? Are they evangelical or a gun owner? Are they heterosexual or straight? Perhaps they're a homeowner or take a law and order stance towards criminality. Are they male, married with children? Do they seek to show themselves patriotic? Do they consume petroleum products? Do they support pro-life positions? Are they vaccine hesitant or vegan or vegetarian? Such characteristics are often criticized and even attacked in the popular press. Provide a resume of chapters 1 and 2, perhaps employing this chart. Paul had taught the Thessalonians that the coming evil is currently being restrained, even whilst the worldwide Gentile mission is being completed. During this time, believers have been called by God to believe the truth, sanctified in the Holy Spirit, even though persecuted, they are to stand firm. Next will happen the day of the Lord, as prophesied by the First Testament prophets. When the day of the Lord comes, the restrainer will step aside, allowing a man of sin to be revealed, who performs wonders by Satan's power. During this time, many will refuse to believe truth, and so God will send to them a delusion. Sometime after the man of sin has revealed, the Lord Jesus himself will be revealed from heaven, gathering believers unto himself. He will destroy the man of sin and render vengeance against his enemies. Then will come the new heavens and the new earth, when the wicked will be condemned and perish, whilst believers enjoy everlasting salvation marveling at Jesus and sharing in his glory. Thus, the structure of this epistle includes a greeting, reasons for which they must thank God, and then a request, please do not be disturbed about the day of the Lord. Rather, pray for us and lead a disciplined life. Pray for us that the word of the Lord may spread. Meanwhile, we command you to earn your own living, admonishing those who do not obey what we say, and then finishing with 
a blessing from God. Thus, in this lesson, we're dealing with the entirety of chapter 3. Pray for us and lead a disciplined life. Pray for us that the word of the Lord may spread. Have someone read aloud verses 1 and 2. Then pose this query. What are two requests that we should make on behalf of missionaries whom we support? Find the answers in the verses. And then, what is a biblical criterion for evaluating the effectiveness of Christian ministry? Again, answer from the text. Having worked in some 20 countries over 20 years, I have concluded that there are 10 basic practices that can lead to the word of the Lord spreading rapidly across entire populations. I shall summarize this in 10 practices. First, believers are to find persons of peace who will open their home and networks to the Christian gospel. Evangelists or church planters should then train all believers to evangelize entire households and to baptize them. Help new leaders learn to strengthen the faith of new believers to persevere. Meanwhile, new leaders themselves train workers within new churches to make disciples who love and obey Jesus and his commandments. And then train up disciple makers to start and to lead new cells or house churches. Sixthly, continually depend upon the Holy Spirit to distribute speaking and serving gifts amongst the believers who themselves will undertake works of ministry. By coaching new workers, seek to expand branching lineages of churches and of leaders that reproduce themselves. In so doing, you will train up shepherds or pastors who coach several generations of leaders on the job. To do so, you will edit simple training materials, distributing these through coaches. 9. Edit simple training materials, distributing these to those who coach others. And lastly, track inputs and outcomes, reporting results to leaders who will lay new plans. Remember, the Thessalonian believers were experiencing various kinds of persecution, opposition, and even prosecution. Have someone read aloud verses 3 through 5. Ask participants to make their observations with an opportunity to ask any questions. You then can ask, Are Christians powerless against the devil? Let them reply from the text. And then, Will Christians be powerless against the Antichrist, that is, the man of sin, who will work by Satan's power? If your participants enjoy grammar, you ask them about the phrase, love of God. Is it subjective, that is, it is God who loves, or objective, that is, we love God? Or is it both? Then discuss possible meanings of the phrase, steadfastness of Christ. Provide a summary of the evil one from First and Second Thessalonians. Point out that the term evil is an adjective used with the definite article the, making it a kind of noun. This is not the abstract word for evil. The adjective alone is used of evil people in chapter 3 verse 2. And in Jesus' prayer at Matthew chapter 6, he likewise probably meant that we should pray, keep us from the evil one. He is empowered by Satan, that is, the historical devil, who is called the tempter, that is, who seeks to work against us. Back to the structure, pray for us and lead a disciplined life. We command you to earn your own living. Have someone read aloud verse 6. After they have discussed the verse, 
pose this query. By what authority did Paul dare to command Christians' behavior? And then, what is our obligation to obey traditions? And in what ways must we keep away from irresponsible Christians? Are we to shun them? Have someone read aloud verses 7 and 8. Consider ways in which Christians can financially support evangelists, missionaries, and church planters. In the early apostolic period, there were self-supporting traveling teams who went through the empire, winning folk to faith and starting thousands of little house gatherings. During the medieval period, Christians often went to new territories, establishing farms and schools by which they supported themselves and through which they evangelized the population. Many Catholic and Orthodox churches establish orders, that is, organizations of celibate men or women who dedicate themselves to spreading their faith, often becoming professionals well respected within local society. In the 18th century, the Moravian movement adopted the practice of sending missionaries to other countries where they set up businesses in new fields to support themselves and their families. During the 19th century, the Protestant denominations often made missionary support a part of their local church budget. In the 20th century, evangelicals adopted the practice of sending missionary candidates throughout the churches to deputate for financial support. In the current century, many are returning to a more biblical form, remaining self-supporting by sending and resending short-term teams. Talk together how Paul may have used his working hours to discuss, train, and pray with his co-workers. Have someone read aloud verses 9 and 10. Let them discuss these verses. Point out that all the verbs in these verses require continuous action, except the verb give. Then ask, what is the best way to teach behavior? Find the answer in the verse. If your church is seeking to train its members to become Bible teachers or home group pastors, then recognize that there are three complementary modes of education. The first is formal. This includes classrooms, prepared lessons, and the giving of lectures. This is for cognitive or mental development. Bible schools and seminaries excel in formal education. Non-formal education consists of field work, getting practical experience actually doing the work of ministry. This is how we learn skills and adopt best practices. Then there is informal education. When you and co-workers travel together, work together, talk together, this leads to affective development, adopting attitudes and confidence and a desire to continue in the work. Consider how the Apostle Paul with Silas and Timothy used all three forms of education. Have someone read aloud verses 11, 12, and 13. If your learners enjoy linguistics, you might point out that the term busybody is a verb, periergazo, which is formed from the first part of the verb to live, peripateo, plus the ordinary verb for work, which is ergazo. That is, there are those who work at making themselves a nuisance. Have participants talk for a moment or discuss for a moment why were earning a living and quiet work so important in Thessalonica? Remember the social and legal situation in which they were found. And then, what do all governments want from citizens? Quiet, compliant, citizens who keep the laws, pay their taxes, 
and encourage others to do the same. And what happens in a society where there are those who are discontent? Pray for us and lead a disciplined life, admonishing those who do not obey what we say. Have someone read aloud verses 14 and 15. Talk together about these verses. Then ask, If we are saved by grace through faith without works, then what is the place of obedience in our life? Note the difference between good works and works of law. Recall the words of Jesus, If you love me, you will obey my commandments. You might ask as well, what does it mean to admonish? How do we admonish one another without being nosy or judgmental? Especially we men, how can we encourage the downcast and disheartened? Conclude with verses 16, 17, and 18, asking, how can we know when we have peace? Peace is a dominant theme in many societies. How do folk in your community seek to experience peace? As a point of grammar, note that the phrases, The Lord be with all of you, and The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with all of you, has no verb in the Greek, and can equally be translated, The Lord is with all of you, and the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ is with all of you. Which do you think is the better translation? And then, how do we know when the Lord is with us? If there is time, ask participants to share one with another what they learnt from this passage. And then ask, what shall we do about it? And then, what should we ask God to do? Note that in our next study, we shall return to the book of Acts, chapter 17, to the account of Paul in Athens, Greece. There we'll seek to learn what can folk know about the true God before they receive the gospel? And then, what do pagans need to learn about the true God in order to be saved?